welcome to RTS Yorkshire Talks. I'm Fiona Thompson and I'm Chair of RTS Yorkshire. Today I have the pleasure of catching up with Jo Haddock, who is celebrating her 10th year with Leeds-based True North. Now Jo joined us in Yorkshire after working for a range of production companies, including Endemol, Celador and BBC Entertainment, where she was busy developing and producing programmes across the factual range. More recently, Jo has been executive producer on Say Yes to the Dress, Lancashire, presented by Gokwan. Now this is in its second season with 20 shows on TLC. Jo has also been a strong supporter of RTS regionally and when time permits, she's been a very active member of our committee. So Jo, I'm really delighted to have you join me today. I know how busy you are and really grateful for your time. But before we get into what people probably want to listen to is about Say Yes to the Dress Lancashire. So I'll talk about yourself, because it's been about six months since we hit this bizarre period in our, in our lives of COVID and lockdown. And uh, how has it been for you? Um, well, it's probably been similar to most people in that every day is a new challenge, um, work-wise and family-wise. Um, we, uh, as you know, at True North, we make a broad range of shows and some of which we've managed to keep in production um, and some of which we had to pause for a period of time. Um, so it's been kind of managing um, all of that. We were actually in the middle of delivering our some of our episodes for Say Yes to the Dress when lockdown hit. So we had to, just like a lot of people, we had to work out a way of um, carrying on with the editing process of Say Yes to the Dress and delivering the show, but obviously we were all in our own homes. So suddenly, just like a lot of people, um, our edit producers were in their homes, the editors were in their own homes, and, um, and I was here at my desk where I feel like I've been forever. Um, and it was a completely different way of working. So, so getting our heads around how you deliver um, a series when you're still in the edit was a, you know, a huge challenge, but it's all credit to everybody for being as adaptable as they always are in this industry. But from a personal point of view, just like everybody else, my children were at home. There was, you know, the challenges of, the technical challenges and our Wi-Fi was really bad. Um, and suddenly there was four people in the house trying to um, all get on Zoom calls at the same time or all use the internet. I know everybody's had similar challenges. Um, I mean, my daughters are secondary school age and they have been amazing in terms of being independent and working hard and doing their schoolwork. But a lot of Minecraft and, um, and TikTok and all those things as well. So, you know, we've, 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 um, we've had our challenges, but it's been ups and downs. Um, but yeah, I've just got really used to sitting at this desk in the bay window of my bedroom. Um, and this is my working environment. And it's, it's just, you know, that's, that's what life is now, isn't it? It is, isn't it? But it, it's so completely different, isn't it? Because television always being such a, uh, a, a creative environment in which that sparking off other people all the time has been so important. And that's had to be shifted. Plus the fact that you're no longer in the office up at True North. As you say, you're at home where you've got the added responsibility of, of, of managing the impact of COVID on family members as well. So do, do you miss that office, you know, creativity moment I really miss it I mean I have been into the office in the last in the last month I've probably been into the office about four or five times and um, just having that contact distant contact is is kind of so refreshing because having those conversations like developing ideas and brainstorming and even just having normal meetings is really it's draining on on this format um, I, I've personally found it really hard to have proper creative conversations on a Zoom call, but you know, you have to, we have con we've continued developing, we've, um, you know, our development um, team has been busier, it feels like they've been busier than ever, um, trying to come up with ideas that fit the ever-changing demands of the channels and the needs and the environment and everything. 
but yeah, it's just, it's so different to try and have those brainstorms and feel creative and feel a connection when you're not in the same room as somebody. Um, so I, yeah, I've, I've found that hard and juggling it with like being a mum as well is, you know, you can't, that you haven't got that moment where you stop working and you pack your bag and you get home and you think, right, I'm home now and now I'm being the mum. It's like I walk out of that door behind me and, or they come in or whatever, you know, it's family life. It's just right here. You can't separate the two. So yeah, there's, there's definitely challenges there. Yeah. There isn't that commute to do that brain shift isn't it from work yeah yes we're, yeah. we're inhabiting each other side by side very much in a way that we've never never done before so anyway, let, let's let's go back to um say yes to the dress uh lancashire i know we're yorkshire but this is lancashire we'll talk about that in a moment let's go back to uh right to the beginning of it really and and how did it all start and, and was it success a big surprise to you or were you kind of banking that that was the case? It came out of a relationship that we were building with Discovery anyway. We were talking to them um, about lots and lots of ideas and we were developing ideas for a, ver um, a number of Discovery's channels for Really and Quest Red and HGTV and, and TLC. Um, but to be honest, the, the Say Yes to the Dress Lancashire idea came directly from Discovery. And as you know, Say Yes to the Dress is a big global brand. It was born in the States. It's a big hit um, in America, but also all over the world. Um, and I think Discovery just wanted to, to see if there could be a potential spin-off um, in, in the north of England. Everyone was feeling the love for, you know, your anything with Yorkshire in the title and so I think they thought that perhaps there would be a way to create something that felt homegrown um, from our region so they anyway they came to us and said well if we were going to do this do you think there's a boutique do you think there's a location that where we could film you know what do you think's out there so it was very much a you know a, a, an investigation you know an early you know we were looking for um, a, the perfect location and we didn't know that we would be able to find it. So that's the first thing that we did. We put the feelers out, we spoke to wedding dress shops um, and people in the industry. And you know, a lot of wedding dress shops are gorgeous, but because they're on a high street or they're just, um, they're above another place sometimes to keep the privacy, they're often just by the definition, they're small, there's not a huge amount of room, you know, in terms of it being a filming location. So we did sort of narrow things down quite quickly um, to a couple of options. But, you know, the place that we found uh, where we do now film Say Yes to the, Sh Say yes to the Dress Lancashire is, you know, it's almost like we, we would have designed a boutique like that. It's a ready-made location. It's an incredible property. It's on three floors. It's really big. It's beautifully styled. We didn't, we didn't have to do anything to make it, you know, to, to make it more of a set, um, apart from add some more lights and, you know, block out a few windows and things. So it was, it was almost like we dreamt up this place and then found it. Um, and that's, it's not just the location, it's obviously the, the business itself and the, the, the family that run the business. It's, it's about that as well. You know, the, the Paula, who owns the business, she's an incredible businesswoman, but she's also, she just created this incredible um, environment where brides-to-be can go in to find their dream wedding dress. And it's, it is like walking into this absolutely amazing place that you, you just it's like being transported literally we could have dreamt it up and then you know we found it so it, it was meant to be it was definitely meant to be and did Paula take much persuading um I don't think persuading I mean she was very kind of you know obviously when we first approached her we couldn't really even tell her you know what it was we were talking to her about we we just said you know would you be potentially interested if there was a tv show that we could film here so it was all very sort of early and sort of tentative but once we start once we were able to explain to her um 
that it was going to be say yes to the Dress Lancashire. I think it was, she, she was obviously concerned about the disruption to her own business because, you know, a film crew takes over. Um, but I think because Jess Fowle and I, who's a, Jess obviously is the creative director of um, True North, she and I had been to visit Paula by this time, you know, several times, we'd built up the relationship, um, we talked her through what um, taking part would involve. She, it wasn't like she was, um, she took a lot of persuading, I think she just came along for the ride and she wanted, she was interested to see, you know, how it would unfold. Um, so she was very much with us on the journey of <laughs> discovering what it would be like to make Say Yes to the Dress Lancashire. And, you know, the reason it's in Lancashire is, well, Paula actually has two boutiques and they're both as beautiful of each other. Um, one is in Silsdon in Yorkshire and one is just over the border in Colne in Lancashire. And it just happened that the Colne boutique was bigger and offered us more scope to make the show. Um, but yeah, she is definitely a Yorkshire and a Lancashire business. She manages to bridge that divide. That has been she does, she does. And, so, and so does her amazing consultants and staff. Um, they're, they're all from Yorkshire or Lancashire. And also the, the people that come, I mean, she attracts people from all over the country and the world sometimes, but her core business is Yorkshire and Lancashire. Um, so it's, it's lovely to think that the brides, you know, can go to both of those boutiques. Yeah, and, and as you're now heading, you're in the middle of your third series, making the third series, which we'll talk about in a moment, but does that mean that, that Paula and her team have almost become part of the production team now? It's totally a partnership. I mean, we couldn't make it without them, obviously, because they provide the location, but we, you know their their expertise is in is in wedding dresses they speak to brides all the time so we are you know we literally couldn't do it without them they're always kind of letting us into insights into the industry about what styles dresses are coming or if we you know if we get a bride who's asking for a particular unusual style of dress then you know of course we're going to call up Paula or one of her team and say look you know this bride has come to us and we're not sure if we can find a dress for her and then they will be able to answer that question um so they've helped us massively they've helped us massively when it comes to making sure that we prepare the brides properly for their consultations they've given us so much insight into how their world works and obviously because we're filming um them as a you know we're not telling them what to do we're filming their day-to-day -day life um we have to work as a team we have to work as a partnership and we were all you know, up until COVID, we were literally rubbing shoulder to shoulder with them for, you know, days at a time. So we have got to know each other really well. And, you know, absolutely 100%, we feel not just part of the team, but part, you know, it feels like a family. Well, that's, that's really good to know. And, and I know something as people say, you know, it feels like a family, it can sound a bit like a cliche, but you really get that sense when you watch the program here that there is that, there is that family feel. Because one of the things I think that's important to say about the program is that, yes, this is about a dress, but it's about a dress for a particular day, for a particular occasion. And so the, the story doesn't end at the end of the program, it goes on. And I think what comes across from the program is that care and that support for the bride and uh, and the family to make sure that they get the right dress that, that, that that's for them. But how easy is it to find those people who want to be part of the show? Well, for series one, it was obviously a brand new, like any new series, um, you know, it's, it's about getting the word out, um, you know, and, and trying to drum up some interest. I mean, obviously having our, having got one as our presenter did help us get that word out because he's got a huge following and clearly having a, a brand that's already known. So say yes to the dress. It's, it already has um, a known brand and visibility and followers. So it's not like starting a completely new series from scratch, which is always hard when you're finding people because they just don't know what the, the series is. So that was on our side, absolutely 100%. But, you know, even so, we were looking for slightly different types of stories that you might have found on other Say Yes to the Dresses. So it was, 
you know, we, we were targeting and um, looking for um, incredible northern families to bring to, to who were who were open to sh sort of telling us their stories. Yes, it's about a dress. So yes, to the dress Lancashire, of course, it's about finding the right dress. But like anyone in telly, you know, we aren't only doing one thing when we make a show. We're we're looking for what story are we trying to tell? What story can this family tell us? And what dynamics are they going to um, reveal to us in that intense moment where their loved daughter, sister, whatever? is is trying to find the dress that she's going to walk down the island and so, so many things feed into that so we we had a huge tick list when it came to casting the first series um and it was challenging to find the right people it really was but you know i think with series one we found some incredible brides um and it really that's really memorable i remember every single one of them i was on every single shoot in series one um and you know i i feel you know we we were lucky to find them i, I think one of the extraordinary things about it as well is the the, the people the inter interaction between the bride and the family and the friends that are there and the tension i i, I never expected there to be quite the amount of tension that there is that moment when you're looking around seeing is it is it a yes is it a no and that the look on the faces when one person just goes no no <laughs> not you ah who could believe that you could get captured by something like that and the thing is you can't script that can you it has to be authentic it really is authentic and we do work really hard to make sure that when a bride comes in to film on the day she feels like she's going through the, you know, as real as, as experience as possible. I mean, of course, there's moments where we have to sort of position cameras and make sure everyone is in shot and things like that. But, but really, a bride is coming in, or bride to be, I should say, is coming in to find her dress, and her family are there to help her. So it does feel authentic. But you know, of course. Um, when you see the show go out you know there's you know it's been edited and there's very there's great music and we've done our storytelling so of course those moments that are real and are authentic are heightened um a because they're they are heightened on the day but b because you know that's that's the way you tell the story yeah and, and you've talked about the uh what what Gokwan can bring to the bring to it with his his fanship as it as it were his his fan groups etc. Um, but was he an automatic kind of fit in for this sort of a show? I think I mean as soon as the as soon as the channel as soon as Discovery said to us that they they would like Gok to be on the show, uh, I I knew that it would bring a whole nother layer to um, to say to the brand of say yes to the dress. Um, I worked with Gok a long time ago on the very first series of How to Look Good Naked. I was the series producer. So I, I understand what he brings in terms of um, his just amazing ability to, for, to, to allow, to give women a space to tell their story, to, to show their vulnerabilities and um, to feel that it's possible to feel better as well. I mean, that's it. He's just, he, he brings that straight away. And in terms of the casting, um, you know, it's difficult to imagine for most women standing on telly, looking at yourself in the mirror and accepting criticism from not only your family and friends, but also a watching audience. It is difficult, but knowing that Gok was going to be there, I think it automatically gives people a sense of confidence, but also a sense that it's going to be a positive experience. It's not going to be, you know, about conflict and negativity and criticism. Um, it's going to be a, an overwhelmingly positive experience. I mean, along the way, you've got to have the, the moments where the family's not sure or the bride's feeling vulnerable or someone's made a, a comment that everyone's shocked by. Of course, there's gonna be those moments, but I think what Gok brings is the, you know, the overwhelming feeling that it is going to be a supportive environment. So for the, from a casting point of view, it massively helped to have him involved. Um, and I do think he's a great fit for the show. 
Um, and I think, you know, the moment that he walked into our boutique where we filmed Say Yes to the Dress Lancashire, the moment he, we introduced him to Paula and the team, it was like the connection was instant. And, you know, he gets on so well with um, Paula and her team. Uh, they've become friends as well, which is brilliant. And I think comes across on screen too. So that is a massive bonus as well. Um, in creating this kind of supportive and positive and warm environment that the, that the show has at its heart. Yeah, I think that that, that for me is, is at, at the centre of it, really. It's that affirmative dimension of it, but that it, it wouldn't be a show if the first time they appeared, everybody went, yeah, that's it. You know, that, that wouldn't really be the show. So it, that's why, you know, that kind of finding our way to the right, the right dress, as it were, but it's that confidence, isn't it, then, that you're describing mm -hmm. that Gok will actually support them because there must be yeah. times when the tears, etc., cetera, you, you know, must feel like, you know, this, this is such an important thing. And yet Gok is there to help make sure that they're looked after, but so is the programme. Yeah, no, right. absolutely. He, he's like on a mission on those days to get a yes, you know, that he really wants to find that that bride. And, and he's... Most most days he's really confident because he knows his stuff. He knows, in, and we've done our research and we know that Paula has all the right dresses. And, you know, experience has told us that some days you just think, well, we're going to nail this. It's going to be amazing. But, you know, there are other days where you just don't know. And, you know, obviously we partially cast for that as well because obviously you've got to have an element of wondering if you know, there's got to be days where you think oh god is it you know is, is Gok going to be able to overcome this challenge you know this bride has got a, can't make a decision or her entourage can't that can't agree with each other or there's there, there are challenges which do make you think god are we going to get a yes um but that's what makes that's keep that's what keeps you watching um because you you really believe that he is you know he is facing up to the challenge and he's he's bought into it and you know you wonder whether he's going to get this bride the right dress and it's not just about the right dress actually it's about um it's, it's about so much more yes it's the dress but it's about her sometimes it's about a bride seeing herself the first time looking and feeling amazing and you know sometimes it's obviously the dress plays a big part in that but, you know, how many of us ever stand on a podium in front of a mirror with our family and friends and, you know, open ourselves up to that level of critique? Um, so to be able to stand there and feel confident that not only you feel amazing, but also everybody else agrees, um, it's a lot more than the dress that does that. I think it's the it, it, it's the, the the journey to use a cliche of the day and what each bride goes through as a process of coming on our show. Yes, because no, we can't automatically say that everybody who comes on your show is a really confident person. And we know that actually, even the most confident of women, if you scratch below the surface, have can have issues and concerns and, and shyness about how they how they look uh, and and that particularly comes across in terms of issues of diversity which i know that you've covered in the show how important was it for you right from the beginning to make sure that diversity was embraced i mean look we all get you know um every bride you know no matter what her background wants to get married in a dress that makes her feel amazing and so we want to represent every type of bride of course we do um it's massively important so that everybody watching at home doesn't think oh it's just beautiful 23 year old gorgeous um brides who can stand on telly in a wedding dress and look great it's everybody is um has that right to stand in that wedding dress and feel incredible so yeah we've had some am amazing um women on our show that i'm like i absolutely loved lucy in series one if anyone's seen that she was oh gosh i mean she was incredible she's blind and she didn't you know can you imagine choosing a wedding dress when you can't see it 
that's number one but you know she brought her guide dog Olga to the boutique and you know she put her trust in Gok to help her find the dress but she didn't have a huge amount of body confidence either so those two things added together not being able to really see if you look good or not but also um you know not feeling good about your body but you know that so that was that's probably one of my favorite episodes and I think you know the fact that that the, a clip of Lucy finding her wedding dress and finding her confidence um is on YouTube um on our say yes page and probably if you clicked on it now somebody would be watching somebody would be crying and somebody would be making a really positive comment um and about how amazing it is to see her find that confidence so of course yeah i mean diversity is massively important we 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 want everyone to have the same opportunity to come on to the show and be given the chance to have to be made to feel amazing and it also means viewers can see themselves up there as well a hundred percent a hundred percent yeah this uh, yeah it, it's crazy not to be diverse in your casting Absolutely. But I mean, these are, as, as we said, these are very important times for the bride to be and, and the family, etc. But, and, and that whole family sense of you working together. Do you ever, or any of your team or Gok or anybody ever get invited to the weddings? <laughs> uh, yes. L um, yes, is the short answer to that. There's, there's been invitations. Um, there's been, um, uh, invitations to hen parties and weddings so yeah I mean the, the the casting team who obviously have the closest relationship leading up to the filming um, stay in touch with our brides um, and obviously when we are about to go on air um, we have more conversations with them so the, it's not just about they don't just turn up on the day do their shooting and then and then we never see them again we're absolutely in touch with them and often when we are back in the boutique filming at a later date the bride that Gok has has found a dress for like from series one is coming back to Ava Rose Hamilton for the fitting for her wedding and it's like seeing an old friend um and and you know they are the stars of our show so um it's always lovely to see them back in the boutique getting ready for their wedding but yes we have had wed i don't think anyone's actually been to any of the weddings um of the brides where we've found the dress but obviously you know we shoot the weddings as well for um part of the show but um we sh we feature the weddings of brides who are already ava rose clients um, so yes, there is a there is a moment when the team goes to the weddings. Oh, that's that, that that's nice. And do you personally get emotionally affected by any of the stories, or is it? I mean, just, you know, I I literally cry at everything. And <laughs> <laughs> anyone on my team will tell you they like look over at me with, in the office with my headphones on, watching for, you know doing viewings when it's going through the edit, like. I'm yes and and not just once you know I cry on location I cry when I'm watching the rough cuts I cry when I'm watching the fine cuts <laughs> so yes uh, we all do that you know it's not just me but uh, particularly me yes I'm very <laughs> well, I think that's really positive because it means it's not becoming formulaic it's not becoming so yesterday for you it means it's really it, it's real it's still so important to you now you said you're in you 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 said to me earlier that you're in the middle of series three now under very difficult different situations of filming so how's that going what have you had to do well, we haven't actually started filming yet, um, but we are in production with Series 3, which is amazing to have got here, bearing in mind, you know, the, the restrictions and the rules and the regulations and the protocols. And obviously, our number one priority is to make sure that everybody involved in this production is kept safe at any one time. So I guess the biggest question was whether or not we could make Say Yes to the Dress in this crazy world that we're living in um, and you know I'm sure most people in production have been through the roller coaster of thinking one day oh yeah we can do that because we'll because we'll put this plan in place and then the, the next day it's like okay that plan is now out of date let's make a new plan 
and we've been through that process so many times in order to get to a position where we feel today happy that we can yes film say yes to the dress lancashire and we've got all sorts of protocols in place to make sure that we can do it in a way that is is safe but you know i don't know about you but we've just listened to boris johnson and he has just given us a whole new load of um regulations to follow and more on the horizon maybe so although we do have a plan now we're starting filming in a couple of weeks you know we may need a new plan tomorrow so that's that's the kind of um that's where we are but yes we're in um production with series three we're making we're hoping to make 10 episodes before uh, leading up to christmas some might go after christmas um and we are looking for our next 10 episodes worth of brides um and you know we so that's exciting but you know who's going to come through the boutique doors next and what stories can we tell um and who what sort of what sort of people would we like to hear from and feature and help find their dress that we haven't seen before um so that's a challenge as well because you know that add in an extra layer of covid um it means that certain you know we can't for example we can't bring or it would be really difficult to bring a family who were dealing with a big health story we just you know so we can't do that and i'm sure most productions and and people who are over a certain age it might feel like it was probably not safe to to cast a family with an elderly grandparent so you know we do have to think really carefully and also we are trying to find families who have already established households or bubbles within their entourage so that we can bring people safely into the boutique so there's so many um question new questions that we need to ask our potential contributors that we've never had to ask before um so that's that's one layer of the, the sort of extra COVID safety. But then, you know, we we see on screen Gok and the consultant helping a bride into a dress, you know, making changes and tweaking the design or doing up the back and all of it, this is contact. And contact is something that is very hard to do now. Um, and so, you know, at the moment, what we're doing is a really strict testing regime so that the, the, we can feel confident that any contact that we need is done safely. So that's, an, again, that's an, we've all become experts, haven't we, in, in COVID and, and um, infection prevention and everything else that you have to think about. It's almost you've got to say yes to the dress on one side, and you've got to say yes to the mask on the other side. You've got the <laughs> I know. Of you at, the, at the same time, but all part of making sure that everybody's safe. Yes, say yes to the mask and the two meter stick. You know, sort of like literally walking around with the uh, two yeah. meter stick to make sure everybody's distant. And of course, with wedding themselves impacted by numbers and things like that, and what you can actually do for your wedding. So there's all that added emotion in there as well. But if I know anything about, about you, I know that you will make an absolutely stunning series. So let's talk about you for just a moment. How did you get started in this funny old television world? Um, kind of by mistake, um, not, it wasn't a mistake, I did actually decide, um, I was, I spent five years working as a magazine journalist, um, when I graduated, and that, that's what I was going to do, I trained to be a journalist, I trained to be a magazine writer, and that was absolutely 100% my plan, I wanted to edit Marie Claire magazine, um, but, um, I was I was writing uh, features for a magazine called BBC Homes and Antiques, which is still going. Um, and I was very much kind of in the world of people, interiors and people's homes, but also collectibles and antiques. And um, I just got a phone call out of the blue one day from a fantastic woman called Elaine Hackett, who everybody will know. Um, and she was working at what was then Basel Productions, um, which has obviously then become Endemol, etc. 
and Elaine was looking for a researcher for a new Channel 5 afternoon low budget studio antique show um, called Selling the Family Silver and she had been given my name by um, somebody who worked on the BBC Antiques Roadshow who I work quite closely with um, and she said oh we need somebody with your skills with your research skills and your writing skills um, on this show would you like a job in telly and <laughs> And, you know, I, I didn't, <laughs> but um, to cut quite a long story short, she's a very persuasive woman, is Elaine Hackett. Um, and after a couple of meetings, um, I did go meet her and I turned her down probably twice. Um, but the, after the third time of her asking, she just persuaded me to quit my job, to quit my career in magazines and, and start afresh as a researcher um, in a world that I knew nothing about. And it was a baptism of fire, but I don't know, there was just something that made me go for it. So I thought, well, what the hell, I'll give it a try uh, and see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? Um, but as I say, it was a low budget, Channel 5, um, great idea, Selling the Family Silver, presented by Eric Knowles. And it was all filmed at Fountain Studios down in South London. Um, and it was literally, I, I was stepping into a world that I knew nothing about. I didn't know how telly worked, I didn't know how studios worked, I didn't know how casting worked, and literally nothing. Um, so, you know, I learnt a lot very, very quickly um, and had an incredible um, co-researcher on the team called Charlie Napper, who taught me so much really, really quickly. And... I kind of just went for it and it then spat me out the other end. And then I was like, okay, what do I do now? But luckily Elaine, you know, she, she gave me another contract straight after on another show. And then by then I was, I was hooked. I was properly hooked. And I thought, oh God, am I ever going to go back to writing in magazines? I don't think I am. I think we have to say a big thank you to Elaine for, uh, yeah. for persuading you to move, to move across from print to this. Well, I've worked with her a few times since. I worked at Endemol for a, for a while after that. And um, uh, so, you know, we stayed friends and I've, and then I didn't see her for years. And then I saw her, I've seen her recently at a few like industry events. So we, we've reminisced about how persuasive she was that day. <laughs> Well, thank you, Elaine, on behalf of all of us. Uh, oh. But if you could say something to that to that Joe that started there on that on that on that first program, what what would have been the best advice that you could give to that that younger Joe? Ah, oh, it's a really hard question. Expect the unexpected. I mean, I think I think be prepared for anything. Um, be open minded. Um, say yes to as many things as possible um try new things you know don't don't oh uh, yeah there's so much advice I would probably give that person but to be honest I think I probably did take the leap into telly because I was probably looking for a new challenge I just hadn't realized it so I think just be open to new challenges and make yourself um indispensable you know if you're starting out in your career you need to you need to work out why you're there um because sometimes i think possibly some junior members of the team are, aren't quite sure what their role is or what they're expected of or why they're there um so yeah work out why you're there and just do that job the best you can make yourself indispensable um and you you know you will be you will be noticed and you know somebody will see that you are going above and beyond and ask loads of questions and find out you know if you can take on extra responsibilities it's, it's so hard to look back to that time but I think that's what it is it's ex expect the unexpected and yeah. you know understand what your role is and do it to the best of your ability but I think a lot of what you've just said actually uh, is, is what you are currently still doing. You talked about being flexible, being open to new ideas, to being, you know, to being able to change things, to come up with ideas and all, all the sort of things that you're, you're, you're still doing now. So the advice you would give to you all those years ago is exactly what you're still using now. 
But just yeah. to bring us up to date, 10 years since you've been with True North. So what brought you up to Yorkshire? What brought you up to True North? Probably the, the thing that's bringing a lot of people out of London at the moment is like the search for space. You know, I was living in London. I was a series producer. I was um, living with my husband and my first daughter in a lovely but small uh, one and a half bedroom ground floor flat in London, which, you know, we loved at the time, but we did want more space. So we left London. Um, I had another baby. And I, I kind of knew that there was a TV industry in Yorkshire. I'd asked around, I knew that there was some production companies, I knew that there was places that I could um, sort of pick up once I'd had a bit of time off. Um, but it was a little bit like a leap of faith um, to come to Yorkshire. We did have family connections in Yorkshire, so it wasn't a totally kind of random choice. But in terms of my career, it was a little bit of a, a leap of faith. But, um, you know, once I'd been here for, I don't know, maybe about six months, I got in touch with Jess and Andrew at True North. And I just said, hi, I'm here. I don't know if you're looking for anyone. Um, you know, this, this is my CV. I'd love to come and chat when, you know, when you've got time. So I did go in for a chat and I... Um, you know, again, to cut a long story short, I did, I think I did a week or two weeks development uh, on a very specific project for Jess um, at the beginning of 2010. Um, and then, I mean, I haven't been there solidly for 10 years. There's been a couple of, a couple of moments where I haven't been there, but it's pretty much pretty solid. Um, yeah, I never really left. <laughs> That's, that's wonderful. And you, you're working on the third series at the moment. What, what beyond the third series? And um, what for True North? Because True North is a big, it does an awful lot of work. I mean, Devon and Cornwall is on at the moment, isn't it? So there's a lot of True, we, we, we see True North around quite a lot, which is good for Yorkshire. So what, what's in the future for you and for True North? Well, for me personally, um, obviously, Say Yes is a massive focus, um, but um, we've, um, I'm also looking after another series which has, has been announced for HGTV, um, which is called um, My Dream Derelict Home in the Sun. And we are, that's a working title. I think we'll probably stick with that, but it's a working title for now. Um, we are filming and following amazing, brave, crazy, fantastic Brits as they renovate wrecks in France and Spain. I mean, the fact that they are doing it right now, um, some of them have found these properties during COVID and have packed up their lives and moved into the sunshine, um, into these incredibly rundown, dilapidated old houses um, to follow their dream. Um, and we're following them. So it's a very exciting series and we don't really know, uh, you know, how each property is going to evolve and change. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very inspiring when I'm sitting in this, uh, in this chair at this desk day in, day out to be thinking about our contributors who are out there um, in their derelict properties, making them their dream homes. So that's the next, that's the next project as well. And that's, so, so that's for me personally. And then um, True North is, it's, it's incredibly re resilient, um, you know, all of the teams and it's, it's amazing that we've managed to keep so many things running through this challenging time. I mean, A New Life in the Sun, which we make for Channel 4, one of my colleagues, Julie Beanland, I mean, again, she's, been following she's got teams in France and Spain and and other countries in Europe as well following Brits as they set up new businesses abroad I mean it's crazy to think that there are people who are still doing that in this time and managing to keep their head above water but you know that is Julie um, and her team uh, producing that show and delivering it to Channel 4 under incredible situations. So um, amazing kudos to them. But it's not just that, there's there's other shows that have c carried on productions. So we make a show for CBBC called The Pets, Pets Factor, 
um, and that's continued throughout. And as you've seen, Devon and Cornwall um, and Dales and Lakes and various other productions, um, Team Mum, um, and there's, there's, there's a couple of things that I probably can't tell you about. So, you know, it sounds like it's been easy, but it hasn't at all been easy. It's just, it's challenging, it's hard. But as you said at the start, that's what we do in this industry is try and find ways to make the impossible happen. Um, and so that's, I guess that's what everyone's really focused on doing. Yeah, I, know, I think that's absolutely it. You make the impossible happen. And I think it's one of the things about working in factual programming is it's actually working with what are known as ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And through that, it reflects how extraordinary our stories are. And it's down to people like you, Joe, to say thank you because you bring these stories to us. And you put a focus, we say yes to the dress, you put a focus onto that most important time. But as you've articulated, it's not just about the dress, it's actually about the woman and the confidence and the body confidence and that they are prepared to do that for us to watch and to enjoy their story. So thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. It's been a real delight talking to you. And I know that anybody who watches this will, uh, will take an awful lot from it and go straight to YouTube to find <laughs> that story you told us about. So yeah, do it, do it. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Okay.